Greetings, Living Water. Pastor John here, and I'm so excited about what God wants to say to you, to us today. We're in the middle of a series called Reset, and I think this is so important for the moment of time that we are living in right now, because I am absolutely convinced, absolutely convinced that this moment is not a moment that the church will look back on and say we were confined. I believe that this is a moment that the church will look back on and say we were refined, being prepared for something great that God was about to do. And so in the midst of all of the, the, the changes and stalling and frustration that people may be experiencing, we choose to look at this moment and say, God, what are the things that you would reset in our lives today so that when we move forward in the days ahead, it's not a return to normal. It's a step forward into a new kind of normal that's at another level of serving God, seeing God's kingdom come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes a reset is exactly what you need for things to get moving once again. And so we started by uh, talking about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and rhythms of life that will help us to reset, to be fully engaged as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We can talk about what it means to bring heaven to earth, but how do we actually do that? How do we live as a disciple of Jesus Christ? And I believe that there are five rhythms of life that as we learn to walk in those rhythms of discipleship, that you will see that. You will become a person that brings the whole gospel to the whole person, wherever you are, and to the ends of the earth. The first rhythm that we talked about was inside-out change. And this is what inside-out change means. Inside-out change means that I am transformed when I choose to allow God's truth to change my heart and my desires. I live from, that's so important, I live from my identity in Jesus. I think and behave more and more like he did. See, inside-out change means that the gospel transforms me from the inside out. It's not just a list of behaviors or things I have to do. No, it is a transformation that starts on the inside and works its way out. And by the way, before COVID-19 uh, changed everything, uh, we started a series called A New Way to Be Human. And in that series, we talked about several messages about inside-out change. And so I want to encourage you to go back and listen and reflect on those messages. Look at the notes, because those are all ways that you can uh, help and develop rhythms of inside-out change in your discipleship journey. Now we're talking about the second rhythm, which is living naturally supernatural. And what it means to be naturally supernatural is this. A naturally nat supernatural person says, I am a spirit-filled and spirit-led person. I live with the awareness that the spirit is with me and people and places are transformed wherever I go. I embrace his unexpected interruptions. See, that's the, that's the heart of somebody who is living out the rhythm of naturally supernatural. And you were made by God to be a naturally supernatural follower of Jesus. We're going to talk more about that today, and we're going to look at the difference that the Holy Spirit made in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out uh, in, like never before in a way that transformed the church forevermore. In fact, I would say that Pentecost 2,000 years ago was the moment that changed everything for the church. We're going to see how that looked 2,000 years ago and what's relevant to our lives today because I want to suggest to you that the church needs to reconnect like never before with the source of power that God made available through Jesus Christ when the Holy Spirit was poured out 2,000 years ago, that that power that began a transformation that's changed the world more than any other movement on the planet is the power that every Christian needs to reconnect with today. And so we're going to go back 2,000 years ago and read from Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. 
Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, to see this, this promise that Jesus made about the moment that changed everything. Let's read together. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? By the way, by the way, the, the baptism with the Holy Spirit didn't produce what they thought it would. But in fact, it produced something so much more than they could have thought or imagined. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Pause. I think that's such a profound, powerful statement. Don't miss it. In fact, this is true for you today. So I want you to read it with me, but not like Jesus was saying it to the disciples 2,000 years ago. Read it like he's saying it to you and to me today. Are you ready? Come on, get ready. Let's do this together, out loud. But I will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon me. Say it again. But I will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon me. One more time. But I will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon me. That's true for you today. Jesus went on and said, and you, I, will be his witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We could say in Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater, and beyond, in Thurston County, and beyond, in Tacoma, and beyond, and to the ends of the earth. No offense, Tacoma, but to the ends of the earth. That's the power that's available to you and to me in the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to live naturally supernatural. Now, from this point, the disciples went to Jerusalem and they waited for that moment. And when the Holy Spirit fell in power, Peter stood up to explain what was happening. And after he had preached the first post-Pentecost message, this is what he said to the crowd. Now, when they heard his message, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter stood and said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. See, that's the affirmation that that promise that began to change the world 2,000 years ago is available to you and to me today. And that's why we pursue understanding what does it mean to be a naturally supernatural disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's talk more about that and see how that will apply to our lives. You see, 2,000 years ago, the church made a fundamental shift. Followers of Jesus were forever changed and began to change the world. And although the circumstances are different today, I believe the, the, need, the need for change is just as real. The source that empowered Christ's followers then is still the one and only resource that can provide for what Christians need today. You are created by God to live naturally supernatural. And when a Christian begins to understand what that means, they stop just waiting to get to heaven and begin to realize that they have been created by God to bring heaven to earth. God, do that in and through us today. And if you agree with that, say amen. I want you to look at what those disciples, what those apostles were facing 2,000 years ago and think about those circumstances in light of what you're experiencing today. 2,000 years ago, those disciples were used to watching Jesus do the heavy lifting. In other words, for three years, those, those men and women had followed Jesus around and almost exclusively, Jesus was the one who was performing miracles and who was teaching and who was 
who was demonstrating what it meant to, to bring heaven to earth. And frankly, the disciples had mixed results when they tried to do what Jesus did. In fact, there's a story that says they went to cast out demons and the demons just took them to town because they didn't understand their spiritual authority, because they didn't understand how to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And they, they really failed miserably at it. And then thirdly, they didn't understand his teaching. They kept coming to Jesus when he would tell a parable and say, we don't understand what this means. Can you explain it to us? They just didn't quite comprehend what it was that he was, he was trying to unpack and what was unfolding before them day and day out. And that was before the crucifixion and the resurrection. And now after that, think about these realities. First of all, the way which they were comfortable interacting with Jesus had radically changed. See, after the resurrection of Jesus, still, everything about what they considered to be normal was, was different now. It was changed. Secondly, their habits and routines and, and normal were, were altered forever. They were changed forever. Think about following Jesus for three years, leaving your business, uh, leaving your family in many cases. And following Jesus and watching him heal the sick and raise the dead and feed the multitudes. Imagine what a ride that would have been. And now Jesus, crucified, resurrected, ascended into heaven. Man, things are never going to be the same. There's no going back to an old normal, not after experiencing that. And there was uncertainty about how their future would look. These followers of Jesus were hunkered down in Jerusalem living under the reality that the one whom they had followed had been executed by the state because of the disruption that he had caused to the status quo. That may not have been the best group to be associated with if you wanted to get a good table at the restaurant. Not after what Jesus had done. Not after the, the upheaval that Jesus had caused. And so as they waited in Jerusalem for the promise that Jesus had made that power would come to be my witness, their future looked more uncertain, more, vol more volatile than ever before. But most importantly, in this in-between space, between the promise and the coming of the Holy Spirit, they were forced to wait. They were forced to wait in all of that uncertainty. I want to pose the question to you, does any of that sound familiar? Jesus had made the promise. I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And so they gathered together and they waited. So here's the first point that I want you to write down. That is that waiting is a part of God's training program. See, like it or not, from the very beginning, waiting has always been a part, a tool that God uses to shape men and women to live a naturally supernatural life. When you look at the heroes of the faith, go back to Moses, and when he went up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, he had to wait for 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah, after he had fought the prophets of Baal, ran into the wilderness and ended up in a cave, sheltered in place, waiting for God to speak to him and show him what was next. Noah was put on a boat and put out to sea for an indefinite period of time in his mind. And every day he woke up waiting and wondering, was today the day when the waters would recede and, and he could start a new life? But he didn't know. And David, David was anointed as king, but then as Saul persecuted him, he was forced into the mountains to wait. And I think the real question is, how do we wait well? The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. That word wait doesn't mean to sit around and, oh, waiting for something to happen. 
No, that word wait that the prophet used is a word that literally means to wrap a cord around a post. It means to tighten, to cling to, to grow closer. See, there is a way to wait well, and it's not to complain and allow frustration to get the best of you. Waiting well means trusting and believing and growing closer to God in the midst of it. Pastor Alec Rollins, in his book, The Presence, said this. He said, God is and must always be the actor and initiator in any relationship of intimacy with him. Any experience of God is from him and for him. We cannot manipulate God into manifesting his presence. See, part of waiting is learning to trust that God will work and move at just the right time in just the right way, and the in-between is never wasted because with God, waiting is never a waste of time. And if you feel like you're in the midst of that right now, I want us to prepare our hearts to receive everything that God has for you in this moment that may be a waiting moment. So I've asked Alec to come and to lead us in a a prayer that is a song that invites the Holy Spirit to meet us right here, right now, in this waiting moment. Would you join me in worship in preparing our hearts to receive what God has for all of us today? Alec, would you lead us? Let's lift our voices in every household and every place that can hear the sound of my voice. And one more time, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. household, in every, every apartment, whether surrounded by friends and family or all alone, that right now your Holy Spirit that knows no bounds, that cannot be stopped, that isn't limited and is never, never without the ability to accomplish what he sets out to do. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts and lives today. Meet us again, and as we are, in so many cases, waiting. Find us waiting well and ready to receive a fresh baptism, a fresh power to be your witness. In Jesus' name, amen.
See, we need that. We need that move of God's spirit in all of our lives. And here's the second point that is the reason that living a naturally supernatural life is so important, and that's this. The Holy Spirit erases the line between the natural and the supernatural. You see, in the Old Testament, before the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, the, the, the Holy Spirit power was available only to prophets, priests, and kings. And in that, the Holy Spirit would come and the Holy Spirit would go. But when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh, every person that would come to God through Jesus Christ, well, that was a game changer. Now, you didn't have to be a, an anointed prophet, priest, and king like you did in the Old Testament. Now, every person. Every person, man, woman, young, old, rich, poor, black, white, and everything in between was a viable candidate in Jesus Christ to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's you. And we see it in the life of the disciples, the difference that was made in the life of Peter, who went from denying Jesus time and time again when Jesus was being tried to just just weeks later, Peter stands up and gives this sermon representing Jesus, the one who had been crucified and executed for his faith and the disruption he caused. Peter, who had denied Jesus time and time again, had no problem saying, no, I'm with him. And anybody who, who isn't is on the wrong side of history because Jesus Christ is the one who demonstrated he is the son of God and invites every man, woman, and child to come into his family to be a part of the kingdom that he is establishing. And Jesus said it like this in John 14, 12, that wh whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works because I go to the Father. And the disciples began to live that reality out. See, this group of people that had once just been watchers of what Jesus was doing became participators in the greatest move that has ever changed the world that we have ever seen and ever know and is still changing the world today. But see, for every person that says, I will be a naturally supernatural follower of Jesus, you need to know this, that living a naturally supernatural life doesn't mean that you always feel like a spiritual superhero. And I think that idea could be one of the greatest barriers between, between the rest of us who don't see ourselves like that. And what God wants to do in and through your life is that reality that being naturally supernatural doesn't mean you feel like a spiritual superhero. In fact, the Apostle Paul, the greatest apostle of all times, he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, that I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. Does that sound like a superhero to you? In fact, I think more of us can identify with how the Apostle Paul felt there than we can Peter standing up and preaching this great sermon. But look at what Paul says. I was with you in a demonstration of the Spirit and power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What that means is that maybe the weakness that you feel or the inability that you feel may actually be a part of God's plan so that as you move naturally, supernaturally, the Spirit of God through you, you don't get the credit, He gets all the glory. And that's always been the point from the very beginning. See, being naturally supernatural means that you have a growing faith that trusts God to give you what is needed to bring heaven to earth. Being naturally supernatural doesn't mean you, you're, you're a superhero. It means, go back, it means that you have a growing faith. And today, if you can say, I, I want my faith to grow. I want to learn how to trust God to be that conduit that brings heaven to earth everywhere I go all the time. You don't have to start out putting on a cape and tights. No, you start out saying, God, I want my faith to grow, to trust you to be who you've made me to be. And the second thing is that being naturally supernatural means you have a growing humility to take risks to extend the kingdom of God. 
See, if you want to be naturally supernatural, you have to be willing to make some mistakes because by default, being supernatural means you're outside of your comfort zone. You're outside of what you can produce and what you can manufacture. Now, being naturally supernatural says, I have a growing humility because I love God and I want to be the vessel that he's made me to be. And so I'm willing to take some risks that may cause me to be disappointed or to look like a fool from time to time. And see, for some of you, that, that disappointment, because you prayed a prayer that wasn't answered, because you trusted God and you didn't see the answer that you were hoping for, has discouraged you and caused you to believe that this doesn't apply to you anymore. But I want to say to you that it's actually just the opposite, that failure when you're learning to trust God is not a setback, it's always a set up. That from God's perspective, when we fail, when we're trusting, when we fail, when our humility and faith are growing, that, that's never a setback from God's perspective. No, it's a setup because he is using those moments to shape you, to change you, to teach you, to refine you to be who he's made you to be. And to every person that's disqualified themselves because things didn't go the way you, th you thought they should, and to every person who is afraid to pray a prayer of faith one more time, to lay your hands on the sick one more time, to share your testimony one more time, I want you to be freed up and to say that from God's perspective, you've not failed, you're just being set up for a greater work that God is going to do through you. And Lord, I pray for every man, every woman, young and old, every student that's shared their testimony on campus and somebody's tried to ridicule them, every spouse that's tried to be that example of Jesus to their loved ones and hasn't seen the results that they wanted, every person that's that's prayed a prayer of faith and didn't see the answer they were hoping for, God, I pray that right now, you would break the bonds of discouragement and you would cause faith to begin to rise again to believe that they've not failed and that you've not failed, but that you are refining their lives for something greater yet to come. Give us a growing faith as we trust you more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close our time together, I'm gonna leave you with this. I want to encourage you to stop seeing this moment in time as a forced shelter in place and instead to see it as a once in a lifetime opportunity to learn to wait well on God. No more complaining, no more shaking your fist, no more allowing frustration to get the best of you. No, it's time to trust that this isn't just about the circumstances, it's about what God is doing in the midst of it, and it's a once-in-a-life opportunity to learn to wait well and let God develop something of a more naturally supernatural follower of Jesus Christ in you in the meantime. Secondly, I want you to start seeing yourself as a chosen participant in the next chapter of God's story. See, this is a moment, but there's a new chapter that's going to unfold. We're not going back to normal. No, none of us are. There's something new, something prophetic, something powerful that's coming, and God is preparing you to be a part of that. In fact, I want you to say this out loud. I am a chosen participant in the next chapter of God's story. Would you say that? Say it with me now. I am a chosen participant in the next chapter of God's story. Yes, you are. And finally, let's invite the Holy Spirit to fill you once again. You are a candidate to live a naturally supernatural life. And that growing faith, and growing humility are all that God requires of you to go on this journey to learn what it means to be a naturally supernatural follower of Jesus Christ. And in the weeks ahead, Pastor Fawn and I are going to unpack from God's word uh, more and more of how often and frequently the Bible teaches us what it means to be that kind of a disciple, 
and how it will transform you from somebody that may just be waiting to get to heaven to somebody who's bringing heaven to earth day in and day out. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to fill us once again. And maybe you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're not a Christian. If that's the case, today you can invite Jesus Christ to be the Savior, the Lord of your life. See, starting a relationship with Jesus Christ doesn't mean that your circumstances will change immediately. But it does mean that there is a supernatural hope, joy, and peace that will come and reside in your life as you learn to trust him. And as soon as you make that decision, you can ask and say, Father, would you send the Holy Spirit to fill me from head to toe so that I can have that supernatural power to be who you've made me to be and to live the life that you've created me to live. Let's pray together. Father, we ask right now, all across Thurston County, Mason County, Lewis County, King County, Washington, the Pacific Northwest, and even the East Coast, and everywhere in between. And we ask in Jesus' name that you would pour out your spirit on us afresh in a new and a powerful way. We thank you that there's no limit to the resources available from heaven, and so we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, pour out more and more and more. Forgive us where we've become distracted and frustrated irritable, demanding. God, we choose to walk humbly before you, trusting your timing and trusting what you are doing in the midst of our waiting. We choose to cling to you. And in that, pour out your spirit in a mighty and powerful way. And prepare this church for the mighty work that's just around the corner. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, church. Make sure you stay tuned. There's some things that you need to hear just after this. But now may God bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he send his spirit to indwell upon you and within you and to give you power to be his witness. In Jesus' name, amen.